Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the second uh, session on the webinar uh, series. Um, it's indeed very heartening for us to see so many of you in such large numbers. And uh, we are indeed fortunate to have Dr. Kamala Mukunda here with us. So we thought, uh, who best than the author to address uh, us? Um, Kamala runs a school called the Center for Learning uh, on the outskirts of uh, Bangalore. Uh, once the lockdown period is over, uh, with Kamla's permission, I would call to visit the school. It is uh, doing fantastic um, for uh, more than two decades now, if I'm not uh, mistaken. And uh, they have put in place a lot of practices uh, that many of us only dream of. Thank you. Um, so without uh, much further uh, ado, uh, I will hand over to Kamala and Edible. Uh, over to you, Kamala. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation and uh, joining us today. Thank you, Maitli, for the your kind words about the book. And actually, this is a nice way to get out of lockdown, no? to meet new people and to reach out to the world. So thanks for this opportunity. Uh, so I hope I'm going to be uh, speaking in a way that will help you in the course that is upcoming, right? The course is on the psychology of development and learning. And what I've tried to do is to just give you a kind of a framework within which what you then later learn, you can interpret. Hmm? So it's a very broad framework and I hope it will help you. Okay, so the objective of this session is, as I said, to give an introduction to key ideas, issues, and concerns at the interface of development and learning. So for me, I took that word, this, uh, this uh, mandate was given to me, this sentence, and I took that word interface very literally. I tried to understand, to so re-look at it, to see are development and learning overlapping, separate, same, what is the connection, okay? And next. So I'm trying to summarize what, what we'll talk about. What is the relationship of education to cognitive development? Okay, since the word learning and development are neither completely synonymous, meaning they're not the same, we use the words differently to mean different things, nor are the words completely separate, right? If we were trying for children to learn something that was completely developmentally inappropriate, that also doesn't make sense. Yeah? So can we gain a clearer picture of their complex relationship? And then let us think of teaching. Where would teaching fall in that relationship? Yeah? Because teaching and learning are also not synonymous. So actually we are looking at all three. Hmm? Uh, yeah. So we are going to look at this question of how is human cognitive development related to learning? Are they two different things or the same? Or do they overlap? Next slide. I, find I made a picture of how it is in my mind. Yeah. So on the left, we have the development circle. Everything that happens when a child is growing up that we call development, and I would include, you know, gaining in height, gaining in skill, um, <clears throat> everything, whether it's physical, cognitive, social, emotional, all that is on the left side of that circle. And then I made another circle for all that we call learning. Okay, And here I would include physical learning also, like learning how to walk, or learning how to feed yourself, or learning how to speak in the language of your mother tongue. Then going on to learning how to read and write, all that in the other circle. And I decided to overlap them because I feel there is an overlap and I'll talk about that. And I also decided to put teaching in that learning circle, but not in the development. And I, this is just an idea that I had and I'll explain it to you and we can discuss what you feel. About. Okay, so let's think first about development in general. I don't know how many of you have watched a small child grow up recently. It may be your own child, it may be a you know, a neighbor's child or a cousin, a sibling's child. But if you have, we, we think of development as a very natural process. That word natural is often comes to mind when you think of development. 
it's an unfolding process it's something that's happening on its own time table in a way yeah no question about it how many of you i wonder remember the last time that you watched a baby desperately trying to turn over onto its stomach and i have a short video on here if you can show that okay this is like one of the most exciting moments right if you if you watched the baby do so let's look at some aspects of what happened <coughs> one is i would say there seems to be a, an innate knowledge of what to do in this situation yeah look at the legs the movement of the legs the hands nobody is telling these babies what to do hmm? but <coughs> there's something unfolding about what uh, now i have to lift my head it's very difficult but that's what i have to do okay secondly if you notice this tremendous perseverance and there is this try 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 again as it says on your screen right so i feel like try again so cuz very cute the whole thing uh and in all these examples that we're looking at there is no explicit there's no adult intervention hmm? we we'll just watch for fun for a, a minute and then we'll see one successful turn over here yeah thank you if you are uh, pa that's it so we recognize instinctively that this is a process that doesn't really need adult intervention and that's the sense in which i mean that we see development as natural unfolding according to its own time table and so on but i would call this actually a learning instance also okay this turning over while it is developmental i would call it a moment of learning too uh, for example it's unlike when the first tooth emerges right that's also a developmental process but that doesn't involve these key elements of learning uh, that the turnover milestone does involve so i have just thought and you can add more uh, to this list I, i i in fact if i can give you a moment to write if you can think of some other aspects of what we watched that is also a, makes it a learning milestone not just a development really so i have written that there is endless practice internal motivation uh so the whole drill and practice element is there then there is an element of improvement clearly you can see and there is a, there is an element of accumulation of skill skill that builds upon itself to reach the next goal and the next goal is as you know after turning over comes keeping the head up while on the stomach that's not it doesn't come immediately right uh then moving forward i think that's next right and then hands and knees crawling and there it keeps going from there so i'll give you a minute if you can think of any other learning element time period different for different babies absolutely yes learning takes different amount of time for different babies yeah walking yeah walking is another example like turning over of a developmental milestone that i would call also a learning milestone what about some emotional aspects of yes for being able to hold a toy is another example also yes yes exactly someone has said that environmental stimuli could enhance absolutely absolutely yes babbling is another example so this um, grasping also yes so one is some of you are giving me examples of other um, developmental milestones excellent example and some of you are telling me what are the elements of it that make it a learning milestone also somebody mentioned environmental factors we will get to that it's very important yes all these are good examples when they start talking yes wow there are lots of things coming in i can't even keep up yeah talking somebody mentioned recognizing color ha this is a good one memory retention okay okay pause pause i i i forget so i'm i saw retention and memory that's very interesting do we feel that the second time they try the third time they try there is some memory 
that's helping the accumulation of skin. That's that's excellent. I think it's an open question. I don't even know. And somebody mentioned imitation. I think maybe not in turning over, but certainly in the next stage, walking. I think that imitation might come into play, and in language learning, definitely. Yeah. So excellent idea. Emotional aspect. That's also true. I think the uh, excitement of having moved, and then listening to. Oh, that I asked her to mute it, but in the video you hear these excited parents, you know, going, "Oh, that's great!" Yeah, that's a part of it. That's a part of the learning, the you know, the the, uh, the encouragement that the environment provides. Okay, so now I'm looking actually broadening. This was a, what we might have called a physical development milestone, right? And I'm going to say that when you look at physical, social, and cognitive, and also emotional. development i would say in all these areas there are milestones that can also be seen as learning milestones okay and we see it throughout the first few years of life they all have the, these all that you listed and i listed i think in common with them and i, I would also like you to remember uh, that physical social and cognitive development they are convenient categories when we are learning about this but they are actually not watertight compartments they spill into each other quite a bit and i want to give one fascinating example of this okay a great example to help us understand that cognitive social emotional physical are all closely tied in together is the question of locomotion and locomotion refers to movement i think it would begin with the baby crawling that's the first uh, time that a baby can move on their own uh, on their own uh, let's say okay so locomotion is not only a physical development phenomenon what i'm going to show you is that it is also the trigger for important cognitive social and emotional development too so i'm going to take two examples one is this ability to search for a hidden object you are going to learn about piaget you might have already learned a little bit but not only piaget but other cognitive psychologists say that it's very important that a child when a child understands that an object that is not in front of me still exists okay and that they have a representation of objects that are not present and objects could include human beings yeah so mother goes out of view and says something to the child from from an invisible place but to connect that sound with that mother huh? or to connect objects with where they might be even when they're not visible this is very very important cognitively and locomotion uh, contributes to this because now an infant can crawl and search be able to look for or see things that were earlier not visible yeah so that's one immediate connection and here's another another very important connection let's look at the ability to look where the adult is looking so for example when i point to the moon and i say look at that chanda mama chanda mama nodu okay if you remember children first will gaze at your face uh, you know as babies then they may <laughs> they may proceed to look at your finger and it takes a while for them to look at where you are pointing and that is called referential gazing okay to look where somebody is referring you to look okay and that gets that can get very subtle because i may not be pointing i may just be looking <gasps> look at that okay all of you know that i'm looking somewhere okay and you would if you were in this room with me you would look where i am looking because it's like maybe i'm looking at a snake or maybe i'm looking at something burning on the floor <laughs> when i look like that that is extremely important for children and this develops only after some locomotor experience has happened okay and the reason why we can say this confidently is because even in cases where children's locomotor is significantly delayed it could be because of some uh, physical disability that they have it may be that they are being carried around for longer than uh, other babies because they couldn't walk or they couldn't crawl for some reason could be an accident whatever even then this referential gazing develops only after locomotor experience has begun that means 
the baby has to be able to move on their own volition before some cognitive and as you will see social abilities will develop i hope this has been clear it's a little complex but i'm going to continue with the example with this okay so this ability to search for hidden objects and the ability to look where the adult is looking they have far reaching implications for the development of language uh development of understanding others intention that's called theory of mind uh we are going to you're going to do an activity and look at some videos i think as part of your homework for this session um it also has an implication for the as i said the representation of absent objects by the way language is all about the representation of absent objects and so unless that comes into play language is very limited it's limited to the things that you and i can both see in the present okay and you will learn when you learn about language how that this is a big thing absent objects is a big part of language absent events past future etc fascinating subject okay uh, it's also important for attachment attachment is a social emotional phenomenon that comes about roughly around 1 year of age and it's tremendously important for a child's sex reward development it has implications for when they join school and how they make friends and so it it's a very important thing and all this uh, the roots of it begin with the first crawling Okay, so let's explore why I'm going to continue with this example. So locomotion breaks the close connection of infant with mother. It creates autonomy, which is the child's own will to move, that willfulness, and willfulness also has that ziddi uh, component. Yeah, I want to do this, and I'll try if you don't let me. It begins. It begins here. It produces new goals. obviously for the child and the possibilities of frustration or satisfaction for the infant it also can create new challenges for parents uh there's now i have to as a parent encourage exploration while also discouraging some things that are dangerous and how do parents deal with this for the first time they are really using vocal and facial signal as a matter of like utmost importance so parents respond by communicating to the infant from a distance don't do that okay you can go there yeah 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 that's great all this is very important and learning how to understand all these is a giant step forward in the child's social and emotional development and cognitive i don't know why i didn't add that i should cognitive as well now the child also as soon as locomotion begins it uses checking and looking back at the parent as a guide to exploration this is also a powerful form of learning and distal communication uh, you know they crawl they may be disobeying you but you will notice that they will still look back they need that and this checking and looking back uh, this ability to explore the world with all this along with this comes attachment and i mentioned that it that is an potentially a tremendously influential um phenomenon okay or oh, this is incredible right that all this starts when they start crawling all right so now we'll go on we'll go back to our question about development and learning next slide and uh, somebody mentioned this such a good point the role of the environment okay so when you're looking at development with the learning element the environment plays an important role it's a very important role but i i'm going to point out that it doesn't it's not we shouldn't take it too important i'll explain what i mean by that what do we need a basic environment to, to support this learning is right nutrition the space to explore security love communication and again um maybe we can open it up for a few more aspects of what a normal environment contains okay the environment just needs to support allow and be conducive nothing more really so would you like to add some more elements i will explain later what i mean about nothing more but i just would curious to hear from you what is a good encouragement yes 
Absolutely. Innate environment also will matter rather than in. Yeah. Okay. So motivation, encouragement is part of that. Absolutely. If we were emotionally neutral to what the child were doing, yeah, that would be very. That might actually harm. And not pro I get re reinforcement or appreciation. Good. All these are part of. Uh, external motivation, but apart from uh, that encouragement, perhaps nothing. Good habits at home, yeah, definitely. I mean, we'd need to sort out what those good habits are. The pre-environment, yes, and again, that is nutrition, stress-free. Yes, the emotional bond is very important. Yeah, love, love and communication. A few years ago, um. Uh, a neuroscientist came to our school to talk with us about the, and she works with rats actually, rats and mice, internal satisfaction team. Yeah, and she said, and we asked her, look, tell us the basic bottom line. And she said, love and physical contact, verbal inputs and physical contact. That was very interesting, and it's really missing nowadays. That's so sad. <laughs> I mean, except at home, of course. I hope you're all hugging and Kissing your kids a lot. Nature and nurture issues, endless debate. One of my chapters in the book is nature and nurture, and I hope I sent that. I sent that to my students. Will the external environment affect the pace of development? This is a big question. I'm going to talk a little bit about it in the next few slides. So, uh, organizing certain activities, which can be yeah. Now we are getting into a slightly, we're crossing a line in my mind. Okay, so here's what I want to say. I want to tell you, don't confuse the environment, many of the good things you said, with intervention. And will we be smart enough to know the difference? I wonder. See, I said earlier that we all recognize learning situations that don't require adult intervention. Uh, sometimes I wonder, do we really recognize it? Or do we sometimes try to improve upon nature? You know, we've, we've all seen adults who actively get in there and help babies learn even the skills of turning over, crawling, standing, walking. And they also try to teach, you know, language acquisition. Uh, my own aunt, I remember when I was younger, was teaching her children. We would go up, go for a walk and she would point to something and say, and say, cow. That's fine. I mean, we, we would all say, look, mook. Okay, that's, that's how I would do it. But she was saying cow. And then she would say, that's a cow, okay? And that's a tree. And that for me was crossing some line in my mind. And each of us will have that line in a different place. I'm not judging. But we, it would be good to know what psychology can tell us about it. Right? Do we need to say, that's a tree and that's a bush and that's a cow? Do we, when do we need to bury? Or is it okay to just say, look at that cow? And sometime later you say, look at this tree. You know, there's a difference. In fact, there is this temptation to improve upon nature as parents and teachers, to teach things that might otherwise be learned in good time. And I think the industry exploits this in us. Uh, I, would even, I would say it exploits our anxiety to some extent. Uh, our anxiety, what anxiety? That we're somehow disadvantaging our children by not exposing them to this or that, you know, fancy experience. There's a video there that you could watch. Yeah, let's watch this. Is the sound coming for you? Anyway, there is subtitles. So let's see. So uh, we could take some responses to this on our chat. The child looks stiff. <laughs> it does. Yeah. 
it felt like there was a lack of readiness okay yeah the child looked confused <laughs> yeah. child looked confused uh, looked curious and anxious support is also necessary at times for learning absolutely that will be our teaching thing when we come to that i felt so baby can learn on their own hindering it interfering with nature yeah when you know should be given his own time like maturation learning yeah yeah so would might have wanted to learn yeah we don't know actually how the child feels in this state i myself uh, was put in a walker when i was one year old uh, before i learned walking you know these walkers and uh, i mean i'm okay now so i don't know if the pet has harmed me or not but it's not this yeah very good points all of you and maybe in the discussion section with watching these two videos you you might feel convinced that teaching is a misplaced activity so i i just want to say some of you have said uh, it's unnatural yeah these are the words that come to our mind hmm? and we feel we are interfering i understand that so let's go slow even in our reactions hmm? if i extend this feeling that i have at this moment while watching these videos some people have extended it right through the school year i don't know if you have come across some progressive educators even dislike the word teacher hmm? many of the things you have said they can apply even to things like learning to add subtract learning to uh, you know to read it can be extended this feeling can be extended so we have to be careful when we have that feeling we have to just watch it and see see where it's going okay i have heard uh, some people say i don't like the word teacher that's very presumptuous that's very arrogant you know i i i i continue to call myself a teacher but some people will say you know you should call yourself a co learner or at best you should call yourself a facilitator yeah so there there is a huge category of things that we want children to learn and that we will have to teach and so let's you know let's go slow but let's recognize this feeling in us when it comes up in ourselves and in others so the my question is when should we teach them as the child grows older many forms of learning actually do need some adult intervention and uh, in the form of explicit conscious teaching totally different from the natural unfolding process of development maybe uh, is this explicit conscious teaching even a child surrounded by books for months and years together is not going to spontaneously learn how to read and write some instruction is necessary however a child surrounded by speaking adults and other children who are speaking is going to spontaneously learn how to understand and speak that's going to happen you don't have, you don't need explicit instruction for language and for many many other forms of cognitive development no explicit instruction is necessary merely a, a natural loving environment with space to explore that's all that's needed okay I, i'm reiterating that earlier point. so let's be clear this kind of learning that needs teaching is the kind of learning that we have deemed important and necessary for adult life i don't think there's anything in that sense inevitable about it if society was structured differently or if we thought other things were important like if we were adivasis living in the forest forest very different set of things would be considered necessary and important for adult life okay so it is what we have decided and it is a typical school curriculum like what long multiplication essay writing drawing label diagram of a flower all this that we we have put into a school curriculum it requires deliberate instruction and there is nothing in that sense natural or inevitable about it it is what we have created and so we have to teach it i i hope that's clear when you learn about the evolutionary view of development uh, this will come very nicely in that section next slide so now i'll i'll bring back that development it looked like we moved far away from development but let me bring it back 
Is there anything developmentally about even these forms of learning and teaching? Yeah? Even learning to read. Can we say there is something natural about it? Is there any way that we can bring development back into the picture? This is a very interesting question. Okay, Let's take it up in the case of reading. So there is a part of the brain somewhere here, left side, part of below and in the back. It's a small area of the brain. And it is the part of the brain that is used to decode words. Once I learn to read, that's what I'm using. Right now, I'm reading. You are also reading words on the screen. That is the part of the brain that's doing the decoding of words. Okay? Uh, we know this from a lot of research. Uh, in, a, in people who have not learned to read, this same area, it's not like it doesn't exist. The same part of the brain is used. Uh, but it's used to recognize objects, it's like everyday objects. Okay, for us, when we learn to read, this area is hijacked. Actually, it's not that we stop learning how to recognize objects. Of course, we can. Other parts take over that. But this area is taken over for recognizing words because words are nothing but special objects. Yeah, they are special objects to which we assign meaning, just like any other object. So. That, that part has been used by the reading brain. I have a chapter on this in my second book, so you can look at that if you're interested. It's fascinating. So, so then we can ask, is learning to read natural in any way? We can say it's an artificial construction of human society, reading and writing. But I must say that the brain and body of human beings has to support this learning in some way. Like we had that little part of the brain that could be used. Yeah? Otherwise, it won't happen. Now, now bats echolocate, as you know. And there's no way I'm going to learn to echolocate, no matter how well you try and teach me. I will never learn that because I don't have the necessary, uh, we can call it hardware, but I, I just don't have the necessary developmental equipment for that. Now, the thing about the human brain is it's extremely adaptive. It is, some people have called it a general purpose learning machine. Cognitively, it is extremely adaptive. And not only that, it is a lifelong learning machine. This is something we miss. We often think that learning stops when we stop going to college. Totally wrong. We should be exploiting the learning properties of our brain for all, for all our lives. It's tremendous. And when it comes to the many forms of conceptual learning that are out there in the world, beautiful. Areas of learning like mathematics, literature, history, science, art, music is also conceptual. There is a huge part. Even sports has a conceptual element. Uh, and we can learn pretty much all of these areas of conceptual learning given this brain. That means I'm bringing development back because the developing brain is supporting all forms of conceptual learning. Yeah, this is just a side point. I'm not sure if we need to go into this, but you, when you're reading about uh, the psychology of learning and development, you may read about two models of this evolved brain. One is that, as I said, we are general purpose learning machines. The other view, some psychologists say that we have evolved to learn specific kinds of things. Uh, that is, these are modules, like, like pieces, parts. Um, Things that were useful to early humans. Right? Like, what are these things? Language, definitely. Uh, face recognition, very important because we live in social groups. Basic math, yeah? uh, very basic. Basic counting and adding and subtracting, basic stuff. Uh, spatial reasoning should have evolved to a high degree where we needed it. Social reasoning, figuring out each other's intentions and what are you going to do and what does that mean you think about me and all that very important basic mechanics how objects work so some people feel that all oh, these are the modules we have we have evolved and some people say no brains are general purpose learning machines but in both views we have evolved to be able to learn throughout life a very wide variety of skills and conceptual knowledge areas so we can go beyond what the early humans might have needed if you think about Zoom, there's no way that my brain evolved specifically for Zoom. 
and yet today i am using zoom which is a miracle according to me about for myself but i have learned to use it so somehow this brain has evolved to be able to extend itself in a vast uh, uh, variety of areas yeah so all children can learn a great deal in all the subject areas of a typical school curriculum i'll just pause here sometimes we we feel or we hear that we have to say this child can't learn that i think that can't learn come because we have come uh, up with some benchmarks of what it means to be good enough at something you know when we say this child can't learn math children are going to be at different levels in all this learning that is something we have to accept yeah when we say can't learn there is an element of learning difficulty which you are going to come up which you are going to take up i believe in a later segment which is good that the whole area you should look at but there's also an area of within the normal range lot of differences among them uh, and in all these areas of learning and all this should be okay with us hmm? what happens in school is it becomes not okay not only in school but in ho- at home it becomes not okay because we rank order children and we put cut offs and we call failure and that is so all that uh, different bag of stuff that we bring into learning but since that's not my mandate today i don't have to talk about it i'm glad all that ugly stuff can stay right here um and i just want to say that you are going to learn about several different lenses through which psychologists look at development and learning that's going to be your course i each of them is going to have a rich history a very rich research base you're going to learn some big names like prj vagotsky floyd maybe it's very exciting i just want you to keep in mind that you do not have to choose one to believe and reject the other if you learn about behaviorism and then you learn how to critique it and then you learn about cognitive psychology it doesn't mean that one replaces the other try to keep space in your mind for all these approaches you have to have an eclectic approach because each approach will contain many truths and many gaps which others will fill uh, i think you will find it very interesting this course to compare and contrast in that way and don't feel overwhelmed that you know why isn't there one true approach there isn't let's make it a strength that is in a weakness of the subject psychology that is its strength okay my three and done thank you very much uh, kamla we will now open it up for uh, questions and discussions so if you have specific questions for kamla please raise your hand we will unmute you and you can ask the question or you can key into the chat this way kamla which one shall i take my please i saw one about how do benchmarks come about you take that ah uh, either way yeah okay so uh, so there are two kinds of benchmarks we can look at one is if you're going if you're looking at a as a baby or a child and the doctor or the parent has a set of benchmarks for you know is she or he talking on on schedule or you know eating solid food don't they do okay that's that's as parents we have concerns right and we go to doctors and we ask about it i think there are established milestone ages at which some things should happen but please remember there's a lot of variation and you know there are children who don't talk till they are three and then they don't stop for the rest of their lives so so there is a lot of variation those benchmarks have come about through a lot of developmental psychology research um, and there are averages and there are ranges okay and all parents will have this anxiety of not wanting to be below average not even wanting to be average and i must say that that's the foolish thing because after when you have a range you set the average in the middle half the people have to be on this side and half on this and there's nothing to be worried about okay so that's what the other benchmarks that come in education like how do you mean maybe how do teachers set benchmarks and how do how are curricula set that is also based on a lot of research in educational psychology 
uh, and it's also based in research and education itself. And there is some amount of wash, you know, backwash from what uh, society wants a 16 year old to be able to do. So it's both forces. Like if you look at the kind of math that is being taught in high school, middle to high school, I am not sure that it's coming from some knowledge or understanding that this is what children need to know developmentally at this age. It's coming from, we need to get to the IIT exams by some age and this is, you know, there's a lot of backwash. So, so it's a mess. And I don't think we can, I don't think we have a pure idea of what a child can learn um, just on its own without that, without the external requirement. No, we don't have a pure sense. Gunnar Sundari's uh, question, how to motivate students in regard to studies during sure. lockdown. Huh? How to motivate students? Uh, in regards to studies during lockdown. Oh, yes. That is a difficult one. I mean, it depends on the age. Like, we are, we are uh, already designing our classes for lockdown. And we are hoping that we are going to include some element of discovery, some element of what is around them at home. Like, I, I am supposed to make a whole section on uh, nature studies. And I was thinking that I will encourage them to look for the lizards that live behind the clocks and the paintings at home and try and draw them and tell, tell me if they can figure out how many there are and if they can give them names. I think you need to connect it with what's around them. But this, is, this was true even when they were in school, right? It's not new, but in a distance education thing like this, try to connect with what they have around them. Motivation, if they are older and they have exams coming up, that's automatically more going to motivate them. And I suppose you need deadlines, so ask for work. Ask for something to come back to you and give reasonable deadlines and set those deadlines together with the children. Maybe. You can say, do you think that you can do this within two to three days? I'm sorry, I don't know whether what I'm saying works for all of you. Maybe two personal. I'm sure uh, we can draw inferences from that personal experience. Go ahead, please. Good morning, all of you. I'm Rashida here. Yeah? Ma'am, I had a question. There was this uh, slide which stated that there is learning happens as a general purpose learning as against modularity. So uh, I was trying to relate it to the theories of intelligence. Mm. So uh, nice. do we also draw from there when we are talking about learning? Yeah, yeah, that's a very nice connection you've made. Uh, the thing is, Howard Gardner's multiple intelligences weren't actually based on any psychological research. They were based more, more on his vision of how education should be. I, I, yes. It's been a wonderful contribution. So to map uh, those intelligences onto brain research, it hasn't been entirely successful, but definitely language, math, uh, you know, and spatial. But, but it, there isn't a one-to-one -one map between them. But it's very tempting. And research might be ongoing to see if we can find modules in the brain that correspond to these. The modules that they are talking about are even more basic, you know, like a module for recognizing faces, because this is what we would have needed. If you look at the intelligences, the one, uh, like music, it wasn't needed when we evolved, but so we can call it a, a special yeah, it's a nice question. I don't have a great answer for you. So it's not a lot of no, no, no. Thank you, ma'am. You've helped a bit. We could look at So when there is no psychological connection that uh, Gardner has Absolutely exposed, so we need still... Okay, okay. Thank but you I so think he would, he would love it if people came up with that. <laughs> I had put it in the chat. So ma'am, I wanted to ask, like, uh, different cultures have different ways of raising a child. Uh, yeah like uh, uh, while teaching them language while talking to them and what kind of games we play with them from the uh, infant uh, stage etc yes. 
so uh, when a teacher is dealing with very young children let us say like preschool or elementary also how can she take all this into consideration because she will have children from all different kinds of backgrounds so how and uh, does she take into consideration all of this and her own assumptions also about uh, child mm-hmm. development yeah nice question the thing is this whole thing about each child is different and you need yes and no yeah because each child the children are also coming to us with a kind of common uh, common learning principle okay uh, so how children differ will be in exactly the way you said it will be in their developmental history in what they've been exposed to the kinds of books they've seen the kinds of things they've seen the kinds of people they've interacted with so it's their learning history that will differentiate them and the only and best way i think for a teacher to get to to plug into that is to get to know each child so to know your children individually there's no substitute for that Uh, so i i would try to as a teacher i would try to understand each child where are they coming from what is the language what are their parents doing do they have siblings at home and in talking with children you get to know no if you allow them to speak in class everything will come out so having this one way you know didactic cluster it will help that won't help at all so the teacher has to be willing to ask questions and listen to them and start learning about the kids and where they are coming from and then automatically the connections will come if i want to teach addition i will use the example that works for that child and i will use an example that works for another and then we can share that learning you know one child is sharing saying where they are coming from all the other children are listening to so that we are not always going in that in parallel streams but we bring it together So we're all it's like tributaries, no? Finally, the learning stream has to be one together. We're learning together. It has to start becoming a common uh, learning environment. Hmm? Thank you, ma'am. Please. Uh, Vinny Sebastian has asked a question. The child is so confused. His parents and teachers have different benchmarks for them. So, what do you suggest? Okay. Yeah. In fact, sometimes. within the house one parent and another parent the grandparent so the confusion uh i'm assuming i'll just take one meaning of this which is let's say i've seen so many parents whose children are in high pressure school and the school is demanding something and the parent feels a bit helpless and says that i ended up scolding my child uh, because the school requires this this kind of thing and i've always said your relationship with your child comes first i've always said if you feel uncomfortable scolding or forcing or pushing your child please don't do it there's something wrong with that external requirement and there are alternatives there are, you don't have to you're not doing wrong by your child to reject an external benchmark if it doesn't feel right to you that's one interpretation of your question hello Yes. Hi, hi, ma'am. Yeah, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, de- uh, having girls developmental task. Do we need to look at it differently? Uh, do you mean as a as a parent? Because it a... has milestones set for every age group. I am not familiar with this. This is some e- existing thing. Developmental task. Uh, sorry, I, I don't know. Not. Uh, as I talked about, uh, you uh, uh, in her log. child development book oh okay okay yeah. been a long time since i read about those i don't think i'll be able to help with that i mean can you tell me what aspect of it you would question i mean what i would like to give you is a bunch of doubts and questions and confusion which now taking that you go and read all these things and you will i feel look more critically more intelligently at whatever you're reading whether it's x or x or y development in milestone you will know the kinds of questions you should ask yeah in fact you don't need to uh, how do i say do you get what i mean zia it is there's a good kind of confusion to have they are not going to swallow anything that you read somebody says do x y z no 
I let me try and understand it first for myself in the light of what I have learned. Yeah. Doc, uh, thank you very much, uh, Kamla. It was a very insightful thank you, session, thank and you. Uh, many questions uh, have come with this again. Uh, uh, testimonial to the um, level of uh, engagement that your session has been able to have, despite being uh, over uh, remote access.